Um, no, but you, you may do that. Yeah, you may do that. Does, does that answer? Is that good? Good. So Jacob, see, see the overhead that like, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we start? Okay, cool. Um, I enjoyed our last, <clears throat> our last class, uh, reading the Joseph Pieper article. I hope that you found that interesting. Uh, we're going to continue with that today. Um, we are not going to get uh, to the Summa Theologiae today. Uh, what does the word Summa mean? And what does Theologiae mean? Well, I, some people call theologica would be theological, so theological summary. Theologiae would be of theology. So I call it the Summa Theologiae. Um, is anyone on Zoom right now? Oh, cool. Okay, that could be worse. Yeah, so we can. Oh, yeah, that's actually good. Right, you can pin it. Yeah, 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 that's good. Unfortunately, that's not going to work on my YouTube channel. Right, the recording, what we're going to see is the unpinned. I think you just go to view. Yeah, there we go. So is this what's going to show up on my YouTube video now? I think so. Okay. Yeah, that's what's going to show up. All right, cool. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, hey, Christian, nice to see you. Um. Okay, so yeah, what I was going to say is, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, we are not going to get to the Summa Theologiae today. We're going to continue with Joseph Pieper, um, and and that is going to have implications, I believe, for uh, what we do for the rest of the semester. So, I what I'm guessing right now is that we're not going to be able to spend as much time on Bonaventure as we would. And I'm not sure, we might just do one week on the introduction by cousins, and then that's probably what we'll do. We'll probably do one week on the introduction by cousins, and then one week on actual texts of Bonaventure, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do that yet. So sorry, we're, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go, okay? Uh, but today we're going to continue with the Peeper article. Oops. Today, we're going to continue with the Peeper article. Um, yeah, so here we go. Um, any thoughts or questions from last time? And do I want to use the dot cam? I don't think I do. I don't think I do. Um, I'm going to do Canvas, which I shouldn't have closed it out just then. Okay, we, we made it through Roman numeral two, uh, one, and so we're going to pick it up with Roman numeral two, and I'm just going to start reading, okay? Um, now, who can tell me, let, let me just ask you this, who can tell me how Thomas Aquinas thinks about perfection? Can anyone say something about that? Jacob, how would I make the screen share go away? Right there. Cool. Um, okay, so let me give you a hint. Let me, the answer would be no. Let me give you a hint. Um, if I draw an acorn right here, Mirka, this is my crappy little acorn, what would I draw over here? Yeah, an oak tree, right? Not, not a magnolia tree because See, the tree is organically related to this. Zoom out. Oh, thanks. 
Keep doing that. Yeah. Good. Um, so what kind of oak tree would I draw over here, Mirka? It doesn't look like it, but what kind of tree is that? It's an oak tree. That's exactly right. It's an oak tree. And so Jacob Dunn, this, this acorn is a blank oak tree. Potential. Is this, is this a potential oak tree? No, what kind of an oak tree is it? It's an actual oak tree. So when I taught the, the Aristotle's metaphysical spectrum, I used the word potentiality, which is kind of a weird word. You might just think of it as potential. The acorn is a potential oak tree, but the oak tree is an actual oak tree. And the word that, that, that Pieper uses correctly is actus purus, purus actus. This is how Thomas thinks of perfection. Now, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I don't want to oversimplify it or make it seem like he, like, I don't want, I don't want to make it seem like, for example, Thomas Aquinas does not believe in Christian holiness and different, and, and that kind of perfection. But, but at a basic level, I mean, the thing that gets pre-modern thinkers to start talking about perfection is this notion of telos, this notion of telos that we find very strongly in Aristotle. Remember, telos is all over the place in Aristotle. Telos means purpose. Um, um, one of the four causes is the final cause because for the sake of which one does something. So why are you in college? Maybe it's to get a job. I think that's a crappy reason for being in college, but that's a different topic. It doesn't matter what I think about it. Maybe the purpose, the reason you're in college is to get a job. If that's true, then getting a job is the final cause, the purpose of your being in college, okay? That's the final cause. That would be an example of how Aristotle talks about telos or purpose. And what I'm trying to say to you right now is that the oak tree would be the telos of the acorn. And so the way that pre-modern thinkers think about it is that, is that the oak tree is perfect, perfect. Literally the Greek word for perfect is even in the New Testament is teleotoi. Something like the teleo, teleotos, which comes from the word telos. So like what it means, to, to be perfect is to achieve your telos, to achieve your purpose. Yeah. So, so just for just one, one, one of my stock examples about this is a group of theologians who lived in the 17th century called the Westminster Divines. They, they happened to be Presbyterians or Calvinists, but they said, what is the chief end of man? That word end means perfect, uh, sorry, means purpose. What is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of the human being? And their answer to that question was to enjoy God and to glorify God forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's the purpose. And so if show me someone who's doing that, show me someone who's, who's, who's glorifying God, whatever that means, and enjoying God, then I will show you someone who's perfect in the opinion of the Westminster standards, because that person is living into his or her telos, living into his or her purpose. The purpose of the acorn is to become an oak tree, the kind of creature that has big branches that birds can come and lay their nests in, puts down deep roots, uh, has lots of leaves to do photosynthesis, provides a lot of shade for boys and girls to come and have picnics under. If, if an acorn, is now doing that, then the acorn is achieving its purpose slash telos. And in that sense, the acorn is perfect. And this is what Thomas means by actus purus. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to keep reading. And I just thought of an advantage to using the dot cam, Jacob. An advantage would be that, that I can talk, I can, it's just easier for me to use this than to do the share screen, not share screen thing. 
But yeah. Yeah, so let's let's try it, see what happens. Okay, y'all, we're gonna we're gonna continue on with chapter with Roman numeral two. Um sorry. Roman numeral two. Oh my gosh, I hope we have enough material today. Okay. For Peeper, Thomas's construal of existence as actus purus is of seminal importance. What does that mean? It means it's really important. By the way, let me just remind us this word right here, existence. Remember, earlier we said that um, he, de he defines being as actus purus. Who can remind me what the word for being was? Anyone remember? It's a weird word. If we were speaking Spanish, it would be the, the, word, the word ser, but it's not. It's essay, which is the infinitive. You know what an infinitive is, right? To jump, to eat, to walk. In Latin or in Spanish, um, infinitives end in IR, ER, or AR. And it's something similar to in Latin as well, except that they throw an E on the end. So it's instead of being an AR verb, it's an ARE verb, et cetera. Those are infinitives. Now, this is a very irregular infinitive, very irregular, but it's still an infinitive, and it means to be. But see, being, being is talking about existence, not what. Existence and not what? Essence. Weirdly, because this almost looks like the word essence, doesn't it? But no, 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 no. It's sort of the opposite of essence. It's being. See, by essence, what I want you to remember, what I want you to think about is the, 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 the definition of something that you would find in the philosophically airtight dictionary, okay? And actually, I think I'm no longer a fan of the dot cam. Um, yeah, what, what, what I want you to think of when you think of essence is the dictionary definition in a philosophically airtight dictionary. But that, that thing that's being defined might not exist. So you see, essence is very different from existence slash being. This actus purus, when something's living into its telos and fulfilling its purpose, doing the thing that, 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 let's just say that God made it to do, that's how Thomas thinks of being. So that in a, in a weird way, you could almost say that for Thomas, the acorn doesn't fully exist. Or let's put it like this, it doesn't fully exist as an oak tree. Maybe it fully exists as an acorn, but it doesn't fully exist as an oak tree. This is how he thinks of, 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 of um, full and proper being. It's when a thing is doing the thing that, that, that it's supposed to do. This is why God is sort of like the ultimate example of being. Because can God, is there, because see, there's no potential in God for, for someone like Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas. God is, is, is fully actualized in every way. God cannot, God cannot grow. God cannot improve. God cannot get better at being God or get better at being anything. God cannot get better, period. God is already as good as possible. And so, so that's, that's why, for someone like Thomas, God is being as such. And by the way, Augustine says that same thing, and for the same reasons. All right. Continuing on. I hope that I'm making sense and that I'm, help, that I'm, that I'm being a good professor. Yes, Jacob. Absolutely. Now, oh, absolutely, they think that. They both think that. Um, now, now, they also think that the world is fallen and broken because they're Christians. And Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you say Aristotle. Um, okay, so, Aris, so, so, okay, that's a great question. So what about some acorns that never become oak trees? Is that kind of where you're going with that? Right, right, right. So right. we wouldn't be able to tell that necessarily. 
Yeah, so, I mean, Aristotle totally knows that. He totally knows that things do not, especially in nature. Remember, nature is, for these thinkers, sort of the blooming, buzzing confusion. It's not, nature, nature is the realm of change. Think about Heraclitus. Nature is the, the realm of growth and decay. Nature is, is not, we could say almost, it's not mathematically precise or not systematically stable. Does that make sense? And so Aristotle knows, I'll just go back to my example, not all acorns become perfect oak trees. Not all fetuses become uh, human beings that, 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 that meet Aristotle's standards for full humanity. I mean, it sounds sort of cruel to put it that way, but I'm going to. I mean, Aristotle knows that some babies are born deformed. That's kind of your question, right? And, and what he would say about that is that, yes, that's true that that happens in nature, but that doesn't undermine or disprove the fact that acorns still have as their telos oak tree. The fact that not all acorns become oak trees doesn't undermine the fact that the telos of an acorn is an oak tree. So I think that what, and I've thought a lot about this actually, and I have a big long blog post about it that I wrote like, seven years ago. As, as modern Western people, we tend to, there's something in our minds that makes us think that if there's an exception, it smashes the rule. I'll just give you a quick example. I mean, historically, Christians think that baptism saves. Well, what, 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 what about some atheist that was baptized when they were a baby? In our minds, we tend to think, oh, yeah, here's a baby who was baptized and now they're an atheist, obviously baptism doesn't save. No, 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 that's a very modern way of thinking. A more pre-modern way of thinking would be something like, that doesn't change the fact that, that the purpose of baptism is telos, I, I, is salvation, is salvation. The point is Aristotle isn't like us. We tend to let the exception dominate. Aristotle would say the, the exception doesn't undermine the general principle if that makes any sense. So yeah, imagine someone coming along and saying, oh, not all acorns become oak trees. Therefore, it's not the case that the purpose of an acorn is to become an oak tree. I think it's by observing what acorns do. Now, not all of them, but, but I think that it, let, let's, let's say that you do an experiment and plant 50, let's say 50 acorns and only 10 of them turn out to be big, beautiful oak trees. I still think that it's reasonable to think that that's what's supposed to happen. Even if 40 of them don't make it because squirrels came along and ate them or whatever. Good, 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 good. I'm gonna keep reading. For Peeper, Roman numeral two, for Peeper, Thomas's construal of existence as actus purus is of seminal importance, particularly in contradistinction to the predecessor metaphysics of the medieval period stemming from Augustine. Now remember, prior to the rediscovery of Aristotle in the generation of whom? Yes, you're right. Who are the teachers? Who was Thomas's teacher? Albert, Albertus Magnus or Albert the Great, who was Bonaventure's teacher? Alexander of Hales. And it was in their generation, that is to say in the 12th century where Aristotle gets rediscovered. But prior to that, were people thinking in an Arist Aristotelian manner? What do I mean by people? I mean Latin speaking thinkers. I mean Latin speaking thinkers. I mean thinkers in the Latin speaking West. All of them were Christian. There were Jews and Muslims, they didn't speak. Latin by and large, but we're talking about Christians for now because this is a medieval philosophy class. And so prior to the rediscovery of Aristotle in the 12th century, what is it that was stamping the thought of, of Western thinkers more than anything else? It was Augustine. 
so, so David Newsom did a, a presentation on Anselm and, and Augustine is stamping Anselm's mind more than anyone else. Anselm had not read the vast majority of, of Aristotle's works. Did he think in some Aristotelian ways? Yes. How did that happen? It happened because even Augustine thinks in some Aristotelian ways. Why? Because Plotinus thought in some Aristotelian ways. I mean, Plotinus was a Neoplatonist and all Neoplatonists are Aristotelians, but it was still a highly refracted form of Arist Aristotle that came down through Plotinus and his successors and his successors and Augustine and his successors. So it wasn't pure Aristotelianism. It was Augustinianism, okay? So for Peter Thomas's construal of existence as actus purus is of seminal importance, particularly in contradistinction to the predecessor metaphysics of the medieval period stemming from Augustine. Remember how last time we talked about this idea of the creature as a symbol so a frog, a rainbow, an insect, a woman is a symbol for, for this pre-Aristotelian Western mind. What does that mean? It means that a frog, an insect, a rainbow, and a woman all say something about God. They're all like signs that point to God. Aristotle comes along and, and says, nah, no, you can study an acorn or a rainbow for its own sake. Aristotle thinks that you can become a complete expert on every aspect of an insect and never talk about God. Augustine would say, oh, no, no. If you're going to study an insect and you never talk about God, you're not really fully understanding the insect. Does that make sense? Now, which of those two ways is the modern way of thinking? That's right. I mean, go to the biology department. Are they going to talk about God when in your entomology class? No, they're not. They, that comes from Aristotle. Aristotle says, no, no, no. You, you don't need to talk about God to understand objects in the world. Now, what's interesting is that Thomas Aquinas comes along and he agrees with Aristotle, even though he's a Christian. Now, does he agree with Gustin? Yes, he does. So remember, Pieper's big point is that he's the theologian of the both and. He embraces everything. But he is sticking up for Augustine and he's, and he's wanting to, I mean, for Aristotle, he is sticking up for Aristotle. And, he's, and what he's wanting to say is, hey, creation is valid on its own terms and for its own sake. There is something legitimate about studying an insect and not talking about God, according to Thomas Aquinas. Why is that? It's because creation has its own integrity. I hope I'm making sense. So that, but that's a little bit about the predecessor metaphysics. The predecessor metaphysics would be this notion that everything in the world is a sign or a symbol that points to God, okay? The respective interpretations of Thomas and, Th and Augustine of the ego sum qui sum, what does this mean? It means I am what I am. That's the burning bush, right? Uh, uh, Genesis, uh, Exodus 3.14, Moses is in Mo, Moses encounters this burning bush and there's a voice that comes from the bush that says, I am what I am. I'm tempted to talk for a long time about that because that meshes very well with the notion of, of negative theology and the simplicity of God, but I'm gonna resist that temptation. I mean, I am what I am is kind of a tautology. What is a tautology? A tautology is Mirka is Mirka. Is that true or false? It's true, but does it convey any real information? No, that's different from saying Mirka is a nursing major, right? That is also true and it actually conveys some information. But to say Mirka is Mirka, conveys no information. Well, so it's a tautology. A tautology is A is A. No shit, Sherlock, but you haven't told me anything, right? A is A. That's a tautology. Well, isn't it weird and interesting that whenever this voice comes out of the burning bush in Genesis 3, 
it says, I am what I am. That's A is A. That's a tautology. It might be true, but it conveys no information. <laughs> the voice doesn't say, I am a badass with huge biceps, like Thanos in the Avengers. Is it the Avengers? No. Guardians of the Galaxy. It's both of them. No, the, the voice from the burning bush doesn't say that. He says, I am what I am. Why? Well, it's, maybe it's because God is simple. It's because, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to leave it at that. It's because God is not this, God is not that, God is not this, God is not that. Maybe that's why. So you see, whenever I say that the Greek notion of God, aka Parmenides Aristotle, it like fits really well with, with, with what the Jews said about God. This is the prime example of what I'm talking about. Because this voice comes from out of the burning bush and it, it, it conveys no, no information. I am what I am. Okay, well, what are you? I don't know. You know what I mean? Am I making sense? Good. There's something weird about that. I mean, Zeus would not introduce himself by saying, I am what I am. Zeus would say something like, I come from Kronos and I chopped his balls off. And now I'm, I, I, I can throw light, uh, lightning bolts. None of that is a tautology. All of that conveys some information, but that's not what the God of the Hebrew Bible says. <laughs> The God of the Hebrew Bible doesn't say I can throw light bolt, uh, li lightning bolts. He says, I am what I am. That's kind of weird. There's something about this God that's really, really unusual. And you might say mysterious. You might say beyond our, understa beyond our understanding. And, and what I'm saying is it links up in a, in a very intriguing way with what the Greeks have said about God. Did you want to say something, Jacob? Yes, but I think it's Okay, I'm going to keep going. The, the, respectives in, the respective interpretations of Thomas and Augustine of the ego sum qui sum, I am what I am, of Exodus 3.14, provides a window into these two respective positions. Augustine in his De Trinitate writes, perhaps it should be said that God alone is essentia. Gosh, this is, this is difficult stuff. I forgot that I wrote, wrote all this. Um, showing that for the ancient bishop being in its fullness, truly to be means first and foremost, unchangeability of essence. See, essentia does mean essence. Esse means to be or being, but essentia does mean essence. I'm going to keep going. God alone is full being because God alone is immutable. But that should make, that should make some intuitive sense to you. I mean, if essence is a dictionary definition, then it can't change randomly like Benton. You like that? I'm, I'm putting down some serious stuff today. You know, always shifting shapes. No, if, if you look up, if a dictionary, if you read a dictionary definition, it ha that, that, if the definition is meaningful, it can't just shift and change. Am I making sense? All right. I note that for me personally, this sheds light on book 12 of the Confessions in which it is difficult not to read Augustine's account of creation of consisting as consisting of intelligible beings alone, existing only for the mind. Please ignore that. That's uh, crazy stuff that you don't need to wrap your mind around unless you really, really want to. I'll just say that, that I think that for Augustine, remember how we talked about Plato's line and, and how human knowing is kind of like a journey? So down here you have images and pistis or faith slash confidence. Then you have dianoia, this process that takes place over time. And then at the top you have noose or intellect or what you might call understanding or apprehension or comprehension. The point is human knowing is like a journey of the mind. It begins down here 
with sense perception. You see this, you see this, and then it moves up to some kind of grasp of the whole. What I want to say is that the human mind on this account is, is a progression. It's a journey. It's a process. Well, that's how Augustine reads the days of creation of Genesis 1. Because who can tell me what's created on day one? In the beginning, God, uh, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth is formless and void, and darkness hovered over the surface of the deep, blah, blah, blah. And does anyone remember what God made on day one? Light. Ooh, that's kind of like images. Wouldn't you agree that there's sort of a connection between light on the one hand and images on the other? You can't see images without light. Guess what God makes on day two? The, the firmament. Augustine says, oh, that's faith. faith. So see the second segment of the line. The point is when August, Augustine doesn't take the seven days of creation literally, this is a shock to fundamentalists people who insist on some sort of literal reading of the Bible. Augustine didn't read it that way. Augustine was not a liberal, people. He was not a liberal. There are no liberals in the fourth century, the, the fifth century. Augustine read it in terms of this journey or process of human knowing. That's all I'm going to say about that. And so you see, so you see, when Augustine reads in Genesis 1, on day one, God created light. And on day two, God created the firmament. And on day three, God created uh, the, 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 the land. And, and this. Yes, but, but you know, God never creates the water. He creates the land. And he, you're right, he separates the. That's right. That's exactly right. But, but in, all, in all of those moments, and even in the, on day four, which is like the seed bearing fruits and trees, Augustine doesn't think that that's talking about actual objects in the world, what Aristotle would call composite unities of form and substance. No, no, no. Augustine says that's talking about how we know stuff. So even when he talks about the, the seeds and fruit trees, he thinks that that's talking about the scriptures. See, the scriptures for Augustine are how we know things. Augustine thinks that the scriptures are super important to, to knowing truth. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think it's amazing. Okay, in contrast to this Augustinian notion of being transmitted in turn by Anselm and Bonaventure, for Thomas, being is existential. To, to invoke an emphasis shared by Gilson and Maritain, it is actus purus. We've already seen this. It is that which bequeaths or communicates being to everything that is not God, to all other creatures, which exists as if they were like a flame, which derives its fireness or its heat from the continually burning flame communicating God. Note the metaphorical language. This manner of speaking fits nicely with, with, with Pieper's portrayal of Thomas's view of language as never univocal, never an airtight system. Do you know what un univocity means? Univocity is precise language, language that's scientifically precise. Because if you have any equivocation in science, bad things happen. It, 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 that's not good. You can't have... Like in science, it's important that if you talk about a triangle, you mean the same thing every time you talk about it. <laughs> or if you, if, 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 if you talk about some genus and species of a plant, you want to use that consistently throughout the entire argument. That's univocal language, precise, only one, one very precise meaning. Like mathematics is very univocal. There's no ambiguity in mathematics. Thomas says, we have no univocal language for God. 
the only language that we have for God is, you might say metaphorical, like when the Psalms say that God is a rock or, you know, um, whenever, whenever the prophet, it might be Isaiah, says that God is a still small voice. Those are like metaphors, aren't they? But the word that Thomas uses isn't metaphor, it's the word analogy, analogy. And he gets that from Aristotle, by the way. The point is, we, 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 have, no, we have no literal language of God. I mean, I've tried to tell you this over and over again. We don't know what God is, we only know what God isn't. And then this crazy thing happens called the incarnation, which changes everything for Thomas. Because suddenly the claim is that there was this human life, this person who walked around and loved people and healed their bodies and gave them hope and then laid down his life for them. And the claim is that that dude somehow is the God of Israel. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I mean, it's the craziest thing ever. And yet it seems to be undeniable. And people are willing to die for it. And people say, I saw it. I saw him rise from the dead. Now it was crazy. I don't ask me what I saw because I mean, like he just walked through the wall and, and I didn't recognize him, but I saw him. And so, so suddenly that changes everything that, 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 that we knew about God. Prior to that, we don't know what God is. We only know what God isn't which is to say that we have no literal language to describe God, no scientific language to describe God. So a human being is a rational animal. That word animal is the, is the genus and rational is the species. It's, it specifies the genus. It's the specific difference, rational animal. That's scientific language. And Aristotle says, yeah, that's fine and good when talking about human beings, but we cannot talk that way about God. So you see, so you see, note the metaphorical language. This manner of speaking fits nicely with people's portrayal of Thomas's view of language as never univocal, never an airtight system. For Thomas, in sum, God or being is pure act. That could be on a final exam for you guys. Um, um, God or being is pure act. And this activity communicates being to other creatures who exist derivatively. See, see I don't know if you remember um, 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 David Newsom's presentation and the ontological argument, but the idea there is that somehow God exists necessarily. Y'all doing okay? Somehow God exists necessarily. Well, guess what? That chair does not exist ne necessarily. That chair is contingent slash dependent on a million factors. The tree that was cut down to make the armrest. Um, the factory in Michigan where they mined the, the metal. That chair is consistent on a million things, but God is or contingent on a million things. God is not contingent on anything. This is the ontological argument that David Newsom talked about. Well, that's, it's, that's what's being talked about here. Um, this activity, AKA God, who is pure act, you can see the connection between act and activity, right? So, so, so in, in Aristotle's and Thomas's mind, this tree is performing an activity. What, what is the activity that this tree is perform, performing? It's being a tree. And, 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 and Max is performing an activity. What is that activity? It's being Max. There's no other Max. Only Max can perform that activity. But it is an activity. Actually, that's what it means for Max to exist, is to do the Max thing. You could also say to do the human being thing. But, um, but, but this pure act, this activity of God communicates being to other creatures 
being the other creatures who, who exist derivatively. I hate this little box. I hate that little box. It really bugs me. Um, creatures exist derivatively. God does not exist derivatively. Now, what's kind of weird is that God the Son might exist derivatively because does the Son depend on the Father? Yeah, but that's a different topic. What Thomas, Thomas could, could respond to that by saying, well, God the Father does not exist derivatively, or he might say that the essence of God, that which all three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have in common, that does not exist derivatively. Thomas could say that. All right. Note that Thomas does not exclude the language of, he doesn't exclude the language of essentia from God. Now, who is it that uses the essentia to talk about God? Augustine. What people are saying is that Thomas doesn't exclude that. See, here again, Thomas is the both and. He's given a high five to Aristotle's way of talking, this notion of actus purus, and he's given a high five to the way that Augustine talks. Can y'all, I want y'all to, to realize that the Christian tradition is very diverse. Thousands of years, you know, hundreds of centuries, hundreds of years, thousands of, of years, lots of different voices. Thomas Aquinas says, and they're all good. Now, it's not that he's afraid to disagree with some people, but the tradition doesn't come from one person. It comes from a lot of people. That's why it's called a tradition. Note that Thomas doesn't exclude the language of essentia from God. That is to say, the way Augustine talks about God. It's just that for him, this is not the meaning of Exodus 3.14. Ego sum qui ego sum. I am what I am. The voice coming out of the burning bush. That could also show up on a final exam. Just what is Exodus 3 about? It's about the burning bush. It's about God revealing God's self in these words, I am what I am. It's just that for him, this is not the meaning of Exodus 3.14, nor would an ontology of God be complete in terms of essentia alone. Okay, y'all, I, I don't expect y'all to understand all that. I'm not even sure I understand it all. Finally, I turn to Peeper on Thomas's. Now, this is good, good shit that I do want you to know, and I'll bet, I'll bet you'll like it. And this is our last paragraph. Finally, I turn to Peeper on Thomas's coordination of philosophy and theology, which overlaps, one might say. So it overlaps, right? So we could do Venn diagrams. This, this is good. I, this, is, this is good. I'm glad we're talking about this. What is this? Yes? What does it stand for? Theology. What is this? Yes. Look, there's overlap, right? For Thomas. I want to I want to say something real quick. I want to say something real quick. I want to give you a quick mini lecture on these terms, philosophy and theology, okay? And I, and, 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 and I actually did this already. This is a little bit of review. But remember, what Augustine did not call himself a theologian. And, and you already know how important Augustine is for the whole tradition, right? Like, that's kind of a huge point in this whole class. Prior to the rediscovery of Aristotle, no one is more important than Augustine, right? In the West, especially. But Augustine says this in the City of God, not the Confessions, but the City of God. He says, Verum philosophus amator dei est. Verum philosophus amator dei est. The true philosopher 
is the lover, amator, the lover of God. Let me repeat that. What Augustine says is that the true philosopher is the lover of God. He doesn't say the true theologian. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's because he lived in a different world than we do. For, for Augustine, philosophy is what Christians do. Theology is what, y'all, this is, listen to this. Theology is what pagans do. What's a pagan? That's it. So what Augustine says in the city of God is that there's, there's three kinds of theology and they're basically all bad. Some are better than others, but they're basically all bad. There's what he calls civic theology, which is the gods of Rome, Zeus, uh, 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 I'm drawing a, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, oh, Artemis and Saturn and various civic gods you realize that part of what it meant to be a patriotic Roman citizen was to swear allegiance to the gods, just like in Jesus's day. I mean, just like, just like in the days of St. Paul, like the Christians got in trouble because they refused to like even pour out a libation to the gods of, of Greece. So the first kind of theology for Augustine is basically theology of the state. He, he says, that's bad. He says there's a second kind of theology, and that is, I think he calls it mythical theology. Stories about Zeus. I mean, it's kind of similar. Stories about Zeus, stories about Poseidon. But guess what? For Augustine, that's also bad. And then he says there's a third kind of theology, and he calls it natural theology. And what's he talking about there? That's the kind of stuff that Aristotle did in the metaphysics that we read. Now, Augustine can't say that that's all bad because he likes Plotinus and Plotinus picks up that shit. Are you with me? But he still thinks that, 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 that like it's not the real deal because the real deal is about Jesus Christ. So the point right now is that for Augustine, philosophy, what is philosophy? It's the love of God in Christ. That's what it means for Augustine to be a wise person. Remember, philosophia is the love of wisdom. Well, what does Augustine think the love of wisdom is? Jesus, loving Jesus, loving God. Theology for Augustine is bad. Now, let's move. That's Augustine. That's Augustine. Now let's move to Thomas. Now let's move to Thomas and talk about these two terms, philosophy and theology. Because what happens by the time Thomas arrives on the scene? What's the big thing that happens? Aristotle. Aristotle gets rediscovered. Now, all of a sudden, remember these guys in the arts faculty like C.J. of Brabant and Boethius of Dacia? Yeah, they were priests, but they were like, damn, Aristotle's awesome. Who needs the Bible? That's how smitten and enamored they were with Aristotle. And, 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 and what does Thomas Aquinas call Aristotle? The philosopher with a capital P. So now for Augustine, philosophy meant the love of God and Jesus. But by the time, but, 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 but once Aristotle's rediscovered, the meaning of the term philosophy shifts. Does, does Aristotle talk about Jesus, yes or no? No. And yet now, by the time of the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, when people say philosophy, they're talking about Aristotle. They're not talking about what Augustine was talking about. Do you see that? That's a huge shift. And y'all, because the meaning of the term philosophy shifts, guess what other meanings term shifts? Theology. Now that philosophy means something novel, philosophy. Now that philosophy means something novel, theology comes to mean something novel. And now 
it, 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 it starts to mean what you and I think it means, namely the Bible. The Bible and thinking about the Bible. And that's what, August, that's what Thomas means by sacra doctrina, sacred doctrine. This is how August, uh, Thomas Aquinas thinks of theology, sacred doctrine. In other words, it depends on scripture. Now, would he believe in sola scriptura in the way that the reformers talk about it? No. He still thinks you need metaphysics, you need philosophy, you need Plato, you need Aristotle. So he's not going to go down the scripture alone path. But he still loves the scriptures. He loves the Bible. And he would just say that if you're really going to understand what the Bible means, you need this Greek philosophical legacy. After all, look at, look at the burning bush. I am what I am. Thomas Aquinas would say, if you really want to understand that, you need to know Aristotle and Plato. Nevertheless, the Bible is hugely important. And so sacred doctrina, sacred doctrine, isn't just stuff coming from Aristotle. It's stuff coming from the Bible. And let, let me say one more thing real quick, and then, and then we'll finish this paragraph. So did we talk about revelation versus natural reason last class? I know we did in the intro class, but did we in this class? So just, just super briefly, someone like Thomas Aquinas would say that there's really two big things that, that, that natural human reason could never discover. The Trinity and the Incarnation. What is the Trinity? The Trinity is that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That, 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 that something about God is irreducible, tri irreducibly triune. Is God one? Yes, God is one, but somehow God is also three. And that's one thing that Thomas Aquinas would say natural human reason could never discover. We needed God to tell us that. The second thing about which he says that is the incarnation, that, G, that, 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 that God is man and that man is God in Jesus Christ, that in Jesus Christ, God is man and man is God, the God-man, la incarnacion. That's the second thing that we need revelation for. What is the opposite of revelation? The opposite of revelation is natural reason. And so you see, that's my point about sacred doctrine. See, that's why the Bible is so important, because it's the Bible more than anywhere that tells us, that, that reveals stuff to us for, for Thomas Aquinas. Not just Aristotle, not natural reason, revelation. Now, is reason involved? Hell yeah. For someone like Thomas Aquinas, reason is every bit as important as faith. I mean, if you, uh, that's what I'm trying, that's what I want you to learn from this class. For Thomas Aquinas, reason is every bit as important as faith. So it's not that reason doesn't matter. It's just that we need the things that scripture reveals to us, which you could never get from, August, uh, from Aristotle. You could never get it from Aristotle. You need the stuff that scripture reveals to us. And what are those things? What are those things? There's two. That's right. And it's upon that basis that sacred doctrine is built. And this is what he means by theology. Yeah. So Thomas means something good. But Thomas likes theology. Weirdly, Augustine doesn't like theology. It's just that he means something different by theology. Okay? Now, y'all, are you with me? Good. I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to read this paragraph, and then if we have a few minutes to talk, we will. Finally, I turn to Pieper on Thomas's coordination of philosophy and theology, which overlaps, one might say, but also says more than the traditional understanding of philosophy is ancilla theologiae, 
I have to tell you what this means. This could also be on a final exam. Y'all, I don't know if you've noticed, but now that we're getting to Thomas Aquinas, a lot of stuff is like falling into place. Like the, uh, until we got to Thomas, I was kind of like the whole, the whole semester was building up to Thomas. Now we're there. <laughs> so I've, I've really been laying the foundation for where we are now and for what we're doing now, okay? So this phrase, and Anchile, an Anchila, Theologiae. You already know what theologiae means. Mirka, do you know what it means? What's the book that Thomas Aquinas wrote that we're reading called? The Summa. What? Theolo theologiae. You remember what theologiae means? Theologica means theological. That's an adjective. But theologiae is actually a noun. It means of theology. So, so summa theologiae means summary of theology, but ancilla theologiae doesn't mean summary of theology. It means something else of theology. And you know what ancilla is? Hang on. Handmaiden, handmaiden. You know what a handmaiden is? Kind of weird. Um, Plato talks about it a lot. A handmaiden, anyone know what a doula is? A doula is like a, a midwife. It's a midwife. That's what this is, a, a midwife. The idea is that here's the idea check this out I, i'm gonna i can keep this short check this out i hope that everyone can see how look in this class we've talked about the hebrew legacy and the greek legacy the hebrew heritage and the greek heritage and i hope that everyone can see how for people like Thomas Aquinas, the Hebrew legacy, for, you could think about it like the Old Testament. You could call that the Old Testament. Anticipates Christianity. I think that's clear, right? The Old Testament, AKA the Hebrew legacy, anticipates Christianity, right? Well, in the same way, the Greek legacy anticipates Christianity. That's the idea here. The Greek legacy, Plato and Aristotle, anticipate Christianity. And so ankila means handmaiden. It, it, what it's saying is that, is that the Greek legacy, Plato and Aristotle, AKA ancient philosophy, ancient philosophy was the handmaiden of theology. It, 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 it helped bring theology slash Christianity slash the gospel into being in the same way that the Old Testament did. Can you see how the Old Testament helps bring theology into being? Well, the same is true in their minds and in my mind for the Greek legacy, Plato and Aristotle. Plato and Aristotle helped bring Christianity into being. That's the idea of the ankila, ansila theologiae, okay? Note that for Piper's Thomas, theology, strictly speaking, is the rational grasp of the contents of Revelation. That's exactly what I said right here. The rational grasp of the contents of Revelation, Trinity, Incarnation, the Bible. Okay? So on this account, Piper's Thomas differs from the theologia of Aristotle's metaphysics. That should make sense. Aristotle's metaphysics, remember, Aristotle calls his project of the metaphysics theologia, the theologia. But Augustine comes along and says, boo. Now, he, Augustine comes along and says, that's bad. Like, I don't like that. Like, that's bad. I don't know how to say it. He hates it. Now, he doesn't hate it as much as he hates the other two kinds of theology, the mythical theology, Zeus and Poseidon, and also the civic theology, the theology of the state. That stuff is even worse in Augustine's mind than the metaphysics of, Tom, uh, of, of Aristotle. But see, 
you should be able to understand this sentence. Um, theology, strictly speaking, for Thomas is the rational grasp of the contents of Revelation, so that on this account, Tom, Peeper's Thomas differs from the theologia of Aristotle's metaphysics. I'm going to stop right there. The only point right now is that when Aristotle talks about theologia, he's talking about that thing that y'all read from the metaphysics, the, de the deduction of the unmoved mover. That's what Aristotle says theology is. But that's not what Thomas Aquinas says theology is. Thomas Aquinas says theology is sacra doctrina, which relies on the Bible, revelation, the incarnation and the trinity. Does that make sense? So for example, Arist does Aristotle need the Bible to write what he wrote in his deduction of the unmoved mover, yes or no? No. But does Thomas need the Bible to do sacred doctrina? Yes. That's, that's the point. Yet while Thomas's theology differs from Aristotle's, his philosophy for Peeper does not. Yeah, that's right. That should make sense. Who is the philosopher with a capital P for Thomas? Aristotle. So, so Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle have the same basic notion of what philosophy is. They have a different notion of what theology is. Hence, both disciplines share a common domain or, pers or pursuit or object, reality as a whole. The real difference is that the wisdom of theology is a, of a higher order than that of philosophy. This is obviously for Thomas Aquinas. It being revealed by God and not merely discerned by natural reason's gaze upon the field of nature. Philosophy and theology are seen as bound closely together by Thomas. The major chasm then is not between philosophy and theology, but, between, but rather between both of them and, and the lower discipl disciplines, like law, like rhetoric, like law. Yeah. Here's, here's the point. For someone like Thomas Aquinas, philosophy and theology, yes, there is an overlap, but they're also bound together to form a larger whole. Remember how C.S. Lewis talks about the model? The model is this comprehensive vision of all of reality that the medieval shared. By the way, do we have that in our modern world? No, we don't. In our modern world, we can't agree on anything. You might think that um, we should have a female president, and you might say, no way. Males are the head. You know what I mean? Like we, are, we live in a pluralistic society. That's what I'm trying to say. That's the opposite of the model. When C.S. Lewis talks about the model, he's talking about a single world view that was dominant. That's related to this point that I'm trying to make about philosophy and theology coming together to form a larger whole. Okay? Y'all, I hope that I'm not wasting your time. I know that this is kind of like a fire hydrant. It took me decades to learn this stuff. What I try to do in my classes is to say it in ways that are simple. I tr what I try to do is to give you all the simplicity on the far side of complexity. Anyway, um, we're about out of time. Does anyone have any questions, comments, jokes, or riddles? I'm really glad I'm here. Good. Yes. Good. Dude, yeah. I mean, if you're interested, and I know that not everyone is interested in the same way. I mean, whenever I was in your chair, you know, 25 years ago or whatever, I was eating this stuff up. Like, I, like it, it rocked my world. It changed my life. And I know that that's not true for everyone, but it, it might be true for some. All right. Very good. Peace out. If you're a Jewish person, happy Passover. If you're a Christian, happy Easter. And um, I will see you on Monday. Okay? Peace out. Yeah. Oh, and we will, we, we, look, on Monday, remember, I uploaded the Summa Theologiae on Canvas. We're going to read it. Now, we can't read the whole thing. What we're going to try to do is to zero in on one or two articles and, and look at the structure of, of the article. And, and what we're going to try to do is see how Thomas Aquinas employs a kind of dialectic 
which we have seen in other thinkers like Aristotle and Plato. That's what we're going to try to do. And then after that, we'll move on to Bonaventure. And yeah, um, Malia Fiefer, um, please email me because you are supposed to present today. All right. Peace out. Y'all have a good one. <laughs>